morning. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? All right, good deal. Well, I think I know most of you, but I'll give a brief introduction. My name is Brian Ross. I live in Cypress, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. Um, I don't know actually how many people live with us. My mom and dad, my wife, three kids, whatever that adds up to. Um, originally born and raised in Ohio, I moved down to Texas in 2015, and I am the father of 10 kids, six girls and four boys. Uh, the picture up here was taken about three and a half years ago. It was the last time we were all together in the same place. So uh, we're fortunate enough to see each other usually uh, once a year, but um, it's been a couple years. I've seen some of my kids, so hopefully we'll be able to get back together soon. working or spending time with family. Uh, I like being out, out of doors. And this picture here was taken uh, back in 2018. It's uh, the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's early in the morning, about 7 a.m. And uh, me and my son Michael were heading down to the Colorado River. It was an amazing hike. Um, it almost killed me on the way back out because of the heat and, uh, and just the uh, exertion to get in and out of the canyon. But it was an amazing experience. To, uh, to see and uh, to spend time in, in God's magnificence and uh, nothing greater than to, uh, to descend down 4,000 feet uh, with uh, canyon sides on either side and see God's sun illuminate the many colors uh, in the stone and to see the contrast between uh, uh, desert, uh, greenery, and a little oasis on the way. It's just amazing, uh, the uniqueness of God's creation. And it's just a small part of the earth. So <clears throat> this week, I want to welcome you to class one in a series I've titled Sovereign God and Sinful Man. Here we're going to study the people of God's promise, and we're going to reveal man's sin habit as well as God's sovereignty. Now, sovereignty is a big word that means that God always has everything under control. And I mean everything. The Bible verse, Job 42.2, teaches us about God's sovereignty. It reads, I know that you, God, can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. So for this class, I'm going to leave the bulk of the Bible reading to you. Each day, I'll give you a few historical details for context, and then I'll summarize the important points relative to each day's topics. And I promise I'll weave in application points and questions for you to ponder, and I hope that you'll give yourself permission to deeply think about your relationship with Almighty God as we go through this text. So my reason for giving this class, these classes, is uh, twofold. First, I believe that I'm called to share with you the life-saving information that I was blessed to receive this year as I studied with other believers, as well as information that I received over my entire lifetime. Second is to encourage you, no matter how unfaithful you feel, to listen to God's call to put your full trust in him to save you from your terminal sin condition. And this is my prayer. This week I'm teaching on these five principles that we can apply immediately. We can start today. So first today we're going to see how to trust God to pursue us and how we can consider ourselves his. Tomorrow we're going to see how we need to keep on running to God because it's good for us to be near Him. Third, we're going to see how God generously extends grace and mercy to faithful and unfaithful alike. It's rather puzzling and it'll be interesting uh, class on the third day. Fourth day, we're going to see that God, God's compassion towards us when we suffer overflows out of His deep love for us. And on the last day, on Saturday, we're going to explore how true security in life is only found in God. Alright, 
there we go. Sorry. You know, as you get older, Brother Guy suggested that I, I actually um, print my notes out in a larger font. And I, I might actually have to do that and get a bigger computer screen because it's just hard to see these things these days. So going into a little bit more detail, I'm teaching on these five principles that I just discussed with seven stories. So day one, so I've titled A Tale of Two Boneheads, which makes my wife laugh a few times. So I won't go into details, but um, you know, it, it was a phrase that I may have been heard saying once or twice when we had kids at home. Um, but today, we're gonna talk about uh, Kings Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And we're going to see how God does pursue us and how we can choose to be his. Day two, the title of that class is Pathologic Failure and Flaming Out. Stories about Kings Abijah and Asa, kings of Judah. And we're going to see in day two how it's to our benefit to run toward God at all times. Day three, uh, we're going to study the prophet Elijah. I was talking to brother and sister this morning about that. So uh, we're going to see on day three how God habitually handed out grace and mercy to faithful and unfaithful alike. Day four is titled, Is Anyone Listening? And here we're going we're to look at some stories about God and Elisha. And we're going to see how they respond to people's needs. Here we're going to see God show compassion toward people when, when they suffer. He shows compassion toward us when we suffer. It's because he loves us deeply right where we are. And on day five, we're going to talk about self-destruction done right. I, I think that's my favorite title. Uh, and you can ask me why later. This is a story about King Josiah. And we're going to see that only true security in life is only found in relationship with God. Nothing else can provide that security. So I'd like to give you just a brief overview of the Bible. I think it's good for perspective to understand, you know, what is a historical time span does the, does the Bible cover? And then where are we going to plug in and take a look at this week? So, the book of Genesis tells us how God created our universe, the earth and everything on earth. Genesis also introduces us to Adam and Eve, their family, and their sins. And this all happened about 6,000 years ago. Genesis also introduces us to Abraham's family and to their sins. That was around 4,000 years ago. Exodus shows us how God used sinful Moses to lead his people out of Egyptian slavery and into the promised land. And I estimate this to have occurred about 3,600 years ago. Judges, the book of Judges, shows us how God's tribal nation was led by prophets and judges for a few hundred years. And that's about 3,200 years ago. So we're getting closer to where we live now. Next, we have a period where kings ruled over the nation, initially as one unified nation and then followed by a divided kingdom. This started about 3,000 years ago. Next, both sections of this kingdom were conquered by foreign nations and the peoples were exiled to foreign lands. This exile happened about 2,600 years ago. After a few hundred years of exile, um, some of the people returned to the promised land and rebuilt. A few hundred years after that, we have Jesus' birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and the growth of the church. So today, we have the necessary details required for us to develop complete trust in God, and in so doing, be redeemed from our death sentence. The seven stories that I will teach this week occur during the time period of the divided kingdom. The historical events I discussed this week happened about 3,000 years ago. So your job this week is to find and note the key points and then discover their relevance to you. Our main themes for the week are sovereign God, his redemption plan, and redeeming sinful man. God is sovereign in our lives and in world affairs. He decides who rises, who leads, 
and who falls. We're also going to see that we humans are inherently sinful. We haven't figured that out already. And when, even when we try to obey God, we fall short. But sovereign, compassionate God always has a plan to bless us, to redeem us from our sins. And sometimes that plan inv in involves suffering consequences of our sinful decisions. Sometimes that plan involves us suffering consequences of others' sinful decisions. And sometimes that involves us sinning, even at times when our lives are free from suffering. So let's get started in class one. A tale of two boneheads, Kings Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Trusting God to pursue you. Considering yourself his. The stories covered today are found in 1 Kings chapters 11 through 14 and 2 Chronicles chapters 10 through 12. Feel free to peruse the text as I blab along up here. Today's focus verse is out of 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. Today's class is divided up into three sections. Section one, we're going to look at Solomon's spiritual failures, and the text is 1 Kings chapter 11. Section 2, we're going to look at the division of the, the kingdom dividing into two. And scripture references there are going to be out of 1 Kings chapter 12 and 2 Chronicles chapters 10 through 12. Section 3, we're going to see the spiritual decline in both kingdoms. And again, in 1 Kings chapter 12 and uh, 2 Chronicles, uh, specifically the middle part of chapter 12. Engage. So how do you explain the downward spir spiral toward brokenness and destruction so evident in society, in individual lives, and even within our own hearts? Three key words in this week's class classes will paint a dismal picture for you. Deterioration, division, and decline. Israel's stories revi reveal the long-term and short-term impacts of rejecting God. Sin so corrupts people's hearts and appetites that they willingly choose a destructive path, often ignoring God's call to repentance and restoration. God certainly wants better for us than this. The reality of ruin faced by those who reject God highlights the only hope for humanity and for us as individuals. And that hope comes from seeking and following God. God allows people to experience fo the folly of rejecting him. The sad course of Israel's history offers a stark warning as well as a resounding call to find refuge and hope in God alone. When we surrender to God, he even uses our sin consequences for our good. As humans, we experience both external pressure in the world and a very in real internal battle within our own sinful desires. Rejecting God and choosing sin bears bitter consequences. The truth is, only when we seek God can we truly flourish in this life. So, I urge you, to approach this lesson prepared to recognize sin's traps and to commit to walk with God wholeheartedly. Deterioration within Solomon's kingdom. Solomon's failures. And we'll be looking at the first half of 1 Kings chapter 11 here. So God gave Solomon wealth, stability, peace, and prosperity. 
With that, Solomon made spiritual decay and committed spiritual rebellion. God greatly gifted Solomon with wisdom and wealth. And despite God's gift, Solomon committed tragic sin by turning toward worldliness and away from God. Old Testament law specifically forbade kings from multiple marriages and accumulating gold and silver. And despite God's direct warning, Solomon intermarried with women from many nations, including Pharaoh's daughter. He built high places to accommodate the idolatry of his 700 wives and 300 concubines and joined them in worship. This idol worship went beyond merely bowing down before images and involved many sinful practices. Solomon's compromise reaped tragic results. Solomon faced severe judgment because he ignored God's commands. God announced that Solomon's kingdom would be torn away from him, but not during his lifetime, for the sake of David and Jerusalem. And so as I was walking over here today, this is a side, it's not in my notes, you know, I was thinking, wow, you know, God so adored King David that regardless of how despicable King David's son Solomon was, God chose to delay the consequences of Solomon's sin until after his death. Out of honor to King David. And that just struck me this morning. So, back to the story. We see here because of Solomon's actions, God tears 10 of the 12 tribes away from his family. They're given to somebody else to rule over. So here, Solomon's bitter bitter punishment serves as a warning that God is the only source of true wisdom. And what he has decreed is certain. The truth is, God alone is worthy of worship. In this story, we see God actively pursuing a relationship with Solomon. God appeared to Solomon twice and showered him with abundant blessing. Unheeded warning and disobedience brought God's judgment on Solomon. And we know that God speaks to us through his word. And in his word, he lovingly warns us and openly reveals his commands for our lives. The truth is that those who turn away from God and disobey his commands are subject to sin's consequences, even today. Sometimes those consequences are long-term, and only surf- but only surface down the road, impacting generations to come. Solomon's foes, the enemies from outside. So God raise, raises up external adversaries against Solomon. And we see this in the, the last half of 1 Kings chapter 11. Hadad, who was from Edom, which was a longtime enemy of Israel and a nation that was descended from Esau. When Hadad was a young boy, Hadad's father and all of Edom's men were struck down by David's commander, Joab. Hadad escaped to Egypt and was taken in by Pharaoh, who provided for his every need. The ancient hostility between Israel and Edom still churned in Hadad's heart. So when he heard that King David and his commander, his military commander, Joab, had died, Hadad requested Pharaoh's permission to return to his home country to oppose Solomon. God raised up another enemy against Solomon, Rezan from Zobah. And Rezan also led a band of rebels, this time in the, the area of Damascus. Solomon was able to regain control from Rezan, but he was unable to drive him from the territory. So Rezan remained an adversary in country as long as Solomon lived. So yes, God did discipline Solomon through his enemies that he raised up against him. So let's talk about the enemies that, were, that arose from inside Solomon's kingdom. And again, we're still in the last half of 1 Kings chapter 11. God also raised up an adversary within Solomon's own kingdom. As a young man, Jeroboam had demonstrated faithfulness in his work and was promoted to oversee the labor forces. 
the prophet Ahijah met Jeroboam while he was traveling in the country and revealed God's plan with this visual display. The prophet took his cloak, tore it into 12 pieces, each piece representing one of the tribes of Israel. He gave 10 pieces to Jeroboam to signify that the 10 tribes to signify the 10 tribes over which Jeroboam would rule. Only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin would remain with Solomon's kingdom, and all the others would follow Jeroboam. So in response to his sin, and according to God's word, Solomon's kingdom would be split apart from within. Divine prophecy declared Jeroboam's rise to power, but God also offered him an opportunity to turn to him in faith and obedience. Jeroboam received a conditional promise, similar to the unconditional promise received by David. If Jeroboam remained faithful, God would bless him and establish his kingdom. Ahijah's prophecy came to pass, just as he, he declared. And the truth is here that everything that God promises is absolutely certain. God upholds the truth of his word in every way and throughout all time. Unfortunately, Jeroboam had little regard for God and or his call to faithfulness. And despite clear evidence of God's power and purpose, Jeroboam reject rejected God and sought his own way. Solomon's finale. Scripture remains silent about the remainder of Solomon's life. All that's said is that Solomon died and received an honorable burial. And then his son Rehoboam succeeded him as king. Solomon's reign began with fire from the Lord, but ended hardly with a flicker among forsaken embers. The vast wisdom, wealth, and influence given to the world's well-known king faded when Solomon turned his heart away from the Lord. So was Solomon's rejection of God a deliberate decision, or was it a series of seemingly small steps of compromise and disobedience? As Solomon continually ignored God's command, his heart grew cold. The series of bad decisions he made brought escalating damage. The truth is, human choices matter. And despite Solomon's failures, God remains steadfast and true to his character and his promises. God did not move. Solomon did. A life that promised great hope and immense blessing ended in tragedy. Solomon allowed the comforts of this life to rule his heart rather than God, who is the source of every blessing. Our principle here is to not let the comforts of this life rule our hearts, but instead to let God, who is the source of every blessing, rule our heart. You know, it's much easier to make decisions based on comfort and convenience. <clears throat> but it's true that difficulty and discomfort are always required for growth. So are you willing to put it out there and get uncomfortable to experience true blessing? How are we doing on time there? Good deal. Good to hear. Division into two kingdoms. Understanding Israel's divided kingdom provides perspective for our lives today. As we study this time period, we hear God speak through the prophets and see prophecy fulfilled. We also see that God remains present among his people and fulfills his promises even through challenging times. Israel's history demonstrates that God blesses those who live obedient and faithful lives in relationship with him. We also witness the tragic consequences of rebelling against him. See, God's blessings are not merely measured by physical prosperity or material comfort, but by the daily benefits of a right relationship with him. 
Walking humbly with God was key for the people of Israel, and it remains essential for people throughout time. The truth is, God's unchangeable character is on display as he interacts with his people. Rehoboam's obstinance. And our text is out of 1 Kings chapter 12 and 2 Chronicles chapters 10 through 12. God faithfully kept his promise to David as David's grandson Rehoboam succeeded Solomon on the throne. All of Israel gathered at Shechem for the coronation. During the festivities, the people asked their new king to ease the heavy taxes and labor constrictions that, that Solomon had placed on them. So what does Rehoboam do? Well, he sends them away for three days. And Rehoboam then consults with the elders of the kingdom who wisely urged him to grant the people's request. Rehoboam promptly rejected their advice. He then willfully sought the advice of his peers, men he had grown up with and who currently served him. And in his arrogance, Rehoboam did not seek God. He didn't even pray. Rehoboam ultimately heeded this unwise counsel and his ob obstinance bore devastating consequences for the nation. His pride and foolishness cost him greatly. As he addressed the kingdom with intimidating and hostile words, the nation of Israel was torn apart. The turn of events fulfilled the Lord's prophecy spoken through Ahijah. On top of that, Rehoboam made yet another unwise decision and sent Adoniram, his foreman over forced labor, out to deal with this rebellion. With no respect for Rehoboam or his rule, the rebels stoned Adoniram to death. Rehoboam barely escaped to Jerusalem in his chariot. Continuing in his obstinance and still fighting God's decreed plan, this unwise king mustered up 180,000 fighting men to fight a war to regain the kingdom. But God sent word to Rehoboam through the prophet Shemaiah, This is what the Lord says. Do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 24. God's will always prevails. So Rehoboam and the people obeyed God and left for home. As prophesied, the nation was torn in two. Afterward, the kingdom of Judah gained strength during Rehoboam's reign. He fortified cities in Judah and established military defenses. The Levites, who had been rejected as priests in Jeroboam's kingdom, the northern ten tribes, fled to Jerusalem. And the people from all of those tribes of Israel, who had set their hearts on following the Lord, followed the Levites to Jerusalem, the capital city in the kingdom of Judah. Truly amazing. And this key point here is that the influence of these Levite priests initially strengthened both Judah and Rehoboam. However, and it's unfortunate that Rehoboam turned away from God's law and led the people astray. It's always true that unfaithfulness to God results in ruin. Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Judah and captured the fortified cities. The prophet Shemaiah returned with words of retribution from God. Recognizing God's punishment as just, Rehoboam and the leaders humbled themselves before God, who spared them. They repented. However, they remained subject to Shishak for a period of time. So let's talk about Jeroboam's opportunity um, back in 1 Kings uh, chapter 12, I think around verse 20. Jeroboam seized the political opportunity before him. The Israelites had rejected Rehoboam, killed his messenger, and decreed Jeroboam king. Jeroboam became king over Israel as God declared he would. And amazingly, he rose to power without bloodshed or civil war. Truly amazing. <clears throat> So, it's amazing. We can think that God's word always comes to pass. We can trust him. God is trustworthy. 
Solomon's kingdom was divided in two. Just as Ahijah had declared, the ten northern tribes were torn from the kingdom. These ten tribes retained the name Israel and are referred to the northern kingdom. And it was led, as I mentioned, by King Jeroboam. Judah and Benjamin, the remaining two tribes, combined the southern combined into the southern kingdom under the name Judah and was led by King Rehoboam. The truth is that God remained faithful to his word and his promises and preserved David's dynasty. We see in the Bible that some of Judah's kings faithfully stood with God and upheld God's law and system of worship. However, the Bible also shows us that apostasy ruled within the northern kingdom of Israel. Not one of their 19 kings did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So what caused this decline in both kingdoms? Well, the prophet Ahijah promised Jeroboam a kingdom and challenged him to obey God. Sadly, Jeroboam did the complete opposite. Jeroboam feared that the people would remain loyal to Rehoboam if they returned to Jerus the Jerusalem temple to worship. So out of fear, Jeroboam acted fool on foolish advice and replayed Aaron's terrible example, leading the Israelites into idolatry. Jeroboam even repeated Aaron's very words, Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Wow. <laughs> So we see here Jeroboam sets up two golden calves, one at Bethel on the southern edge of his kingdom and the other at Dan up in the north. Jeroboam desecrated the purity of worship that God intended for his people and he fashioned an idolatrous religious system suited to his liking and to his convenience. He appointed all sorts of priests, initiated festivals on dates he chose and offered sacrifices at Bethel. These were grave offenses because God ordained how he should be worshipped. Jeroboam likely sought to legitimize this system of worship that he had set up. But nothing that departs from God is legitimate. Two accounts of Jeroboam's dealings with prophets further reveal God's warning that Jeroboam ignored to his own peril. We have an account of a man of God from Judah in 1 Kings chapter 13. So we have this nameless man of God from Judah who confronted Jeroboam as he stood by the altar at Bethel to brazenly offer sacrifice. This prophet, this unnamed prophet from Judah, declared that Josiah, a king from David's line, would kill pagan priests and burn their bones on that altar. As a confirming sign, the altar split and the ashes poured out in front of Jeroboam's eyes. So what's Jeroboam's response? Well, he angrily orders the man of God to be seized. And as he's pointing to the man of God, his hand shrivels. So in undeserved mercy, Jeroboam's hand was restored when the man of God prayed for him. He didn't deserve that healing, but God gave it to him. So even in Jeroboam's sinful condition, God was merciful. The man of God's prophecy was fulfilled around 300 years later. In a strange and somewhat difficult account to understand, this unnamed prophet later disregarded God's instruction and was tricked by an old prophet from Israel. As a result of this disobedience, this man of God was killed by a lion as an act of God's judgment because he allowed himself to be deceived by a false prophet. But we cannot fully understand God's purpose in these puzzling events. We can see that his prophecy and promises remain absolute and true. The next run-in with the prophet we have recorded in 1 Kings chapter 14 is with the prophet Ahijah. So God allowed Jeroboam yet another opportunity to turn to him in a moment of desperate need. When his son fell, fell ill, Jeroboam asked his wife to disguise herself and go to Shiloh to seek a prophetic word about the boy's fate. He sent her to Ahijah, the very prophet who foretold his rise to power and promised him success if he obeyed God. 
So I mean, it, it's actually a good plan on his part. Go try to get advice from the guy that always gives you good advice, because that's always a good thing to do, right? Well, God alerted Ahijah that the woman was coming, and the prophet Ahijah delivered devastating news to Jeroboam's wife. Their sick son would die soon. Jeroboam's kingdom, kingdom would be torn from his family. The evil Jeroboam had committed against God was worse than anyone before him. The prophet offered a gruesome description of the end of Jeroboam's dynasty. Not a pretty sight. The boy died as soon as Jeroboam's wife set foot in, in the house, just as the prophet Ahijah foretold. Now, Jeroboam could have turned to God, even as this judgment was decreed. But he chose not to. So, in verses 19 and 20 of 1 Kings 14, we see that Jeroboam died. And these verses offer an embellished summary of Jeroboam's reign as Israel's king. All it says is, he served 22 years and died. His son Nadab su succeeded him. So the damage to Israel's spiritual life inflicted during Jeroboam's reign cannot be overstated. He wasted opportunities, he shunned God's grace, and he led his nation to reject God. So let's turn our attention back to King Rehoboam and his reign in Judah. Rehoboam was a weak leader who failed to lead Ju Judah to follow God wholeheartedly. The truth is that rejecting God and choosing sin brings bitter consequences. The final word about Judah's king reveals spiritual slippage with co costly consequences. See, the people of Judah tolerated idolatry, and, st and this stirred God's righteous, jealous anger. We read that Rehoboam's enemies carried off the treasures of the Jerusalem temple and the royal palace, including Solomon's gold shields. So Rehoboam's response here is to fashion cheap bronze substitutes that seem to symbolize his weak attempt to replace the lasting spiritual treasures lost during his reign. Conflict with the northern tribes of Israel continued through his reign. Rehoboam died and, and was succeeded by his son Abijah, who we'll, we'll learn more about tomorrow. So the principle here is that our sin makes paths of destruction. And if we're honest with ourselves, we see how the negative consequences of our sin impacts the people around us, even those we love the most. The question here is, will you own up to the consequences of your sin? And will you repent from your rebel rebellion and instead seek wise counsel from God and godly people? These are questions we need to ask ourselves every day. downward pull of in your inward rebelliousness against God. Call it the doctrine of sin, its character and its universality. People in today's world highly value personal autonomy and believe they can make their own choices without accountability. What's, what is right or wrong, true or a lie, has become a moving target for most people. However, with clear out, without clear boundaries, chaos and confusion abound. So who has the ultimate right to, de to declare what is good and what is bad? Well, the truth is only God, the Creator, knows and evaluates everything rightly. God stands apart from humanity in His absolute purity and holiness. Therefore, everything we do, think, or say that opposes Him and His will is defined as sin. The truth is that opposing God invites his justified wrath and causes untold harm to ourselves and to others. Human history and personal experiences confirm this is true. Every human born since Adam and Eve, Eve's fall into sin, inherits a sinful nature. We sin because our desires are corrupted, so ruined by sin that we cannot please God. Or 
or satisfy his righteous standard on our own. In our unredeemed state, we value our own pleasure more than God's will. Our minds are so ruined that we are without hope if left to ourselves. Our judgment becomes distorted and the choices we make take us nowhere that matters in the end. <clears throat> Understanding the universal curse of sin elevates our need for God's grace. The gospel addresses both sin's pervasive damage and the only source of rescue known to mankind. In our sin, we deserve only God's wrath. Thankfully, Christ bore sin for all who believe in him. 1 Peter chapter 2 and Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. Three chapters to look at uh, when you're considering the emblems to get you in the right frame of mind. See, God seeks to restore us, but only on his terms and with a recognition of our absolute need of him. He promised to take us back into a full life with him when we respond to him in faith. Without understanding the universal and eternal damage caused by sin, no viable explanation exists for the evil in the world. Even the internal wrestling between right and wrong within the human heart cannot be explained. We will not turn to Christ for rescue if we do not comprehend the personal and societal damage inflicted by sin. The truth about sin is bad news, but this must be grasped before we can readily understand the truth about God and the reality about ourselves and the world. The truth is, sin's damage highlights the unfathomable reach of God's grace. Let me repeat that. Sin's damage highlights the unfathomable reach of God's grace. He, pers he persistently extends mercy to people caught in sin's death grip. <clears throat> Sin enc sin's encroaching damage humbles us before the God we have offended, but who also offers us our only hope. Weariness about our vulnerabilities to sin leads believers to moment-by-moment -moment dependence on God. And while we await eternal deliverance from sin's stranglehold, we can experience the Holy Spirit's power to overcome temptation and sin. And when we do sin, we can run to him in confession and repentance. The truth is, our sin is great, but God, our God is greater. Psalm 28, verses 8 and 9 reads, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his way. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches mercy and teaches them his way. My apologies. So through the cross, God's mercy endures. So let's take this to heart. God extraordinarily gifted King Solomon to lead Israel, but Solomon failed because he ignored God's warnings and succumbed to sin. When Solomon died, Israel was in such a spiritual disarray that rising opposition led by Jeroboam split Israel into two kingdoms. Solomon's son Rehoboam read, led the southern kingdom, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, known as, known as the kingdom of Judah. And Jeroboam, King Jeroboam, led the ten, ten in the north, as we mentioned. And we see that Rehoboam faltered in leading Judah. Jeroboam did even more evil in, in the north. The, the repeated failures and the fleeting successes experienced by God's people in these stories offer us needed lessons. God's redemptive plan did not halt when Israel was severed into two kingdoms. God continuously offered unrelenting mercy and grace to the Israelites and to their leaders, even through this season of destruction. The words of Isaiah the prophet in chapter 65, verses 1 and 2 really sum it up here. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, Here am I, here am I. All day long I have held out my hand to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. And the truth is, 
The bitter consequences come when we reject God and his ways, but blessings flow when we surrender to him, even amidst hardship. So God is sovereign, and God is lovingly, lovingly pursuing us. Most of Israel's kings did not fully surrender to God. How do you measure your devotion to God? Can you know if your passion for him is wholehearted or half-hearted? Well, the truth is, even when we desire to follow God without reservation, an honest look at our hearts often reveals pockets of resistance. In this life, will we ever worship and follow God with, our, with holy, pure motives and untainted devotion? Well, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, 16 and verse 9 tells us that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those who heart, whose hearts are fully committed to him. We are encouraged to reject self-reliance and self-rule and to cultivate a heart that longs to know God. We need so desperately to listen for his voice as he speaks to us in prayer and through his word. We need to run to his outstretched arm when we falter. And while we'll never seek God perfectly until we get rid of our sin nature and are with Jesus in glory, God faithfully seeks and purifies our wandering hearts here and now. So, I ask you again, will you trust God to pursue you? And will you consider yourself his? Tomorrow, <clears throat> our class is titled Pathologic Failure and Flaming Out, where we'll look at Kings Abijah and Asa, kings of Israel. And we'll see why it's important to keep on running to God, because it's good to be near God. To prepare, I encourage you to scan through 1 Kings chapter 15 and 2 Chronicles chapters 13 through 16. Thank you so much for your attention and have a blessed day.